Welcome to worship in the Unitarian Universalist Church of Charlotte. My name is Sandy Wade. I, along with Sharon Baker, will be speaking about our family names. This is part of our summer series, I Am, We Are, What's in a Name? We invite you to greet the people near you as we begin our service. In the words of Emma Lazarus, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door.
Our first reading is a poem by Peter Shinetsky. He has grown tired of the pronunciation of his name, countering the inadvertent how do you that humor or rudeness asks, a few vowels and tooth grinding consonants that must be phonetically rehearsed alone or at night to forestall jibes, embarrassments, false curiosity, the wasted time that a handbook and timetable devotee provokes. Yes, he would argue, there must be places in history where land or heritage asks no exile of the children it nourishes and helps to breed, where a name's not laughed at, reviled, or twisted like some gross truth or as yet unnamed imported European disease. So, he asks, tell me of Stierjetsky, count turned explorer, beside whose name a creek flows through the deserts of South Australia, or why a mountain peaked with snow should resemble a tomb and be named Kosciuszko. Their eyes narrow, nostrils quaver, the seconds between them toll. Deeply breathing, their mouths open, darkly and groper slow.
Like many before them, and many since, my parents, Tom and Pat Baker, searched through a book of baby names before settling on my first name, Sharon. Why Sharon? Mostly because they liked how it sounded with Lynette, which they'd already picked as my middle name after my mother's beloved youngest sister. So, Sharon Lynette. But what about my last name, Baker? The origins of that surname, at least in the case of my family, can be traced to Scarlin, Poland, a small village in the northern part of that Eastern European country. This village was where my paternal great-grandfather lived before emigrating to America in 1892 at the age of 19. In fact, both my paternal great-grandparents were Polish with the hard to pronounce first names of John and Mary. <laughs> John's last name, though, was easier. That's right. My great-grandfather was Yufnevsky, and I'm sure you pronounced that correctly in your head. <laughs> John lived in a region of Poland occupied by the Germans, who demanded that boys learn a trade when they turned 14. He decided to apprentice at a bakery, working without pay but receiving room and board, an important perk at the time as he was one of 16 children. Five years later, John, whose birthday ironically is on the 4th of July, moved to America to escape having to serve in the German army. He was accompanied by his parents and three siblings. This happened in 1892, the year that Ellis Island opened as an official entry point for immigrants. We believe that John and his family came through Ellis Island, although no official documents have been found. We do know that my ancestors were part of the largest, one of the largest waves of Polish immigration into this country. From 1870 until the beginning of World War I in 1914, approximately 1.5 million Poles, primarily poor pheasants, fled to the United States. John and his relatives settled in Buffalo, New York. John met and married his wife Mary in 1898 and began working as a bread baker in Buffalo. A year later, just before the turn of the century, their first son was born, my grandfather, Fred. Over time, the Yufnevskys had four more children, and John became a US citizen. My great-grandfather, who could speak three languages, Polish, German, and English, was a savvy businessman and an agent for the local bakers union of the American Federation of Labor in Buffalo. When his son Fred turned 16 and could join the union, John started helping him get various jobs at bakeries. Within a few years, having picked up some of the tricks of the trade through Fred's experience, John Yufnevsky opened his first bakery in Buffalo and put his children to work there. In those days, everything in a bakery was made by hand. Breads, rolls, pies, cookies, everything. And while Fred was talented at his craft, he didn't particularly like working in his dad's bakery because he had to work nights. Starting a shift at 2 a.m. can put a damper on one's social life. <laughs> Despite his limited dating opportunities, my grandfather met and married my grandmother, Charlotte Lisko, a first-generation American Pole, in 1922. They were both in their early 20s. 
At some point, business slowed at his father's bakery, and Fred looked for work elsewhere. He had always wanted to be a machinist, and now was his chance. But Fred encountered an unexpected obstacle in his job search. Certain companies refused to hire him because he was Polish, as evidenced by his surname, Yufnowski. How could he overcome this discrimination? Well, among his friends on a local baseball team, my grandfather was known as Fred the Baker. So, to avoid anti-Polish bias and improve his chances of finding a job, he unofficially adopted Baker as his last name. Then, sometime in the early 1930s, before Social Security was enacted, Fred legally changed his last name so that it would be official on government documents. Fred Yufnowski was now Fred Baker, and three of Fred's four brothers followed suit. There was a lot of prejudice against Polish people, my grandfather recalled when my sister interviewed him for a college project in the 1980s, and I wanted my sons to be able to get good jobs, so I changed our name. Fred and Charlotte Yufnowski, uh, I mean Baker, <laughs> adopted a son before the name change and then went on to have two biological boys. The youngest was my dad, Tom Baker, who along with his older brother, Bob, became the first US-born Fabulous Baker Boys. <laughs> but no, that's not what that movie was about. <laughs> I have fond memories of visiting my paternal grandparents in Buffalo as a young girl where grandpa always had a pot of kielbasa boiling and an apple or cherry pie cooling on a rack when we arrived. Although he ended up working most of his life as a core assembler in a factory, Fred never lost his baking talent. The homemade crusts on his pies remains the most delicious I have ever tasted. I'm sorry, Liz. <laughs> I inherited my grandfather's love for baking and often spent weekend afternoons as a teenager making cookies and cakes from scratch. I even dressed up as a baker one Halloween. <laughs> a few years after my grandma, Charlotte Baker, died, Fred came to live with my parents for several months. I was home from college that summer and I had a chance to spend more time with him, watching baseball games and sharing meals together. For someone who was judged by his name, my grandfather was one of the least judgmental people that I have ever met. He accepted people for who they were, and I never heard him say a negative word about anyone, well, except maybe for some baseball umpires whose calls he disagreed with. <laughs> Fred Baker died when I was in my early 20s. I decided to honor his legacy by carrying on the family tradition of baking Christmas cookies using a recipe he perfected. Every year, I use my grandfather's cookie cutters and rolling pin. Yep. This was Fred's, a treasured family heirloom. And I make dozens of cookies, drafting my family to help decorate reindeer, Santa Clauses, snowmen, stars, and Christmas trees. The history behind my last name factored into my decision not to change it from Baker when I married my husband, Pete Moore. I had already established a professional career as Sharon Baker, and having been raised a staunch feminist, I had no interest in bowing to patriarchal convention. I didn't second guess my decision to remain a Baker, though, until I had children. I hadn't thoughtfully considered what it would mean to have a different last name than my kids. When they entered elementary school and their teachers and friends started referring to me as Mrs. Moore, I refrained from correcting them. At one point, I even considered legally changing my name to Moore to match Pete's, Emily's, Collins, and Sarah's. But eventually, I decided that the hassle of going to court and paying a fee wasn't worth it. I did, however, concede to tweaking my name to Sharon Baker Moore for many years on my Facebook profile. <laughs> Recently, though, I dropped more from my online moniker, fully embracing Baker once and for all. My grandfather adopted that name for a reason, 
to offer his children and grandchildren a chance to avoid the prejudice that he had faced. And I am proud to stand behind it. The reading today is a two-part excerpt from the novel We Need New Names by New Violet Bulawayo. Set in her native country of Zimbabwe, Bulawayo tells a story through the eyes of her main character, Darling, a 10-year-old girl and her life about her entire and her life after her entire town was bulldozed due to political upheaval. The first excerpt refers to this time period. Look at them, leaving in droves, the children of the land. Just look at them, leaving in droves. Those with nothing are crossing the borders. Those with strength are crossing the borders. Those with ambitions are crossing borders. Those with hopes are crossing borders. Those with loss are crossing borders. Those in pain are crossing borders. Moving, running, immigrating, going, deserting, walking, quitting, flying, fleeing, to all over, to countries near and far, to countries unheard of, to countries whose names they cannot pronounce. They are leaving in droves. 
Look at them leaving in droves despite knowing they will be welcomed with restraint in those strange lands because they do not belong, knowing they will have to sit on one buttock because they must not sit comfortable lest they be asked to rise and leave, knowing they will speak in dampened whispers because they must not let their voices drown those of the owners of the land, knowing they will have to walk on their toes because they must not leave footprints on the new earth, lest they may be mistaken for those who want to claim the land as theirs. Look at them, leaving in droves, arm in arm with loss and lost. Look at them, leaving in droves. The second shorter excerpt occurs after 15 years later when Darling has moved to Detroit, Michigan and still struggles with being in a foreign culture, aware she will forever be an outsider. And then our children were born. We held their American birth certificates tight. We did not name our children after our parents, after ourselves. We feared if we did, they would not be able to say their own names, that their friends and teachers would not know how to call them. We gave them names that would make them belong in America, names that did not mean anything to us. Aaron, Josh, Dana, Corey, Jack, Kathleen. When our children were born, we did not bury their umbilical cords under the earth to bind them to the land because we had no land to call ours. The title of today's service resonates with me on many levels. My maiden name goes back to the Egyptian side of my family, El Bayadi. Literally, it translates to of Bayadia, which is the name of the town my family comes from. El Bayadia is described as a mainly Christian town on the west banks of the Nile where many church towers punctuate the skyline. Those who carry its name carry its history. My father, Nagy al was the first of many that immigrated from Egypt to the United States. You see, my Egyptian family comes from a long line of Coptic Christians. Today, the Copts make up about 10% of the Egyptian community. My dad grew up under the rule of President Nasser. Most people think of Nasser as a good thing for Egypt, he liberated Egypt from colonial rule, broke it free of a monarchy, and stepped it up into a republic. President Nasser developed a very strong tie with the Muslim Brotherhood and had to bow to their influence in many cases. Because of this, the Copts suffered a serious loss of prestige and a series of economic and social restrictions through institutionalized discrimination. My dad was one of those affected by those restrictions. He had a very hard time finding a job, even as a surgeon. Because of our name, our family was essentially branded. So my father did another residency in England for plastic surgery. On paper, it was understood that he would bring his knowledge back to Egypt, but in actuality, my dad used his education as a path to more freedom and inclusion. He found it first in England, where he met my mom. Once they were married, they moved to Boston with the idea that he could set up a private practice as he wished. In 1969, they ended up in a small town in the mountains of North Carolina called Silva. It was here that my dad set up his private practice. 
Imagine the old time physicians that you hear of in the stories. Even though he had an office, my dad did not hesitate to make house calls, especially to the elderly or to those who simply could not make it. He served as a plastic and general surgeon, but also as a family doctor to many in that small town. Also, he served on many community boards and was a general advisor to people. He was, quite frankly, adored by many people in my town. My name growing up was so much bigger than me. It opened so many doors. Once people heard my name, they knew immediately who I belonged to. I cannot tell you how many times people proudly showed me their scars from surgeries. <laughs> One in particular comes to mind. In my early 20s, I was buying something from Eckerd's drugstore with a check. The man behind me was certain I looked familiar and peered over my shoulder to see my name. Once he saw it, he said in his good southern drawl, you're Doc Beatty's daughter, I knew it, and proceeded to unzip his pants. <laughs> At which point the cashier started getting a little nervous. He had to show me the small scar from his appendectomy years ago and regaled me with a story about how my father saved his life. People were also a bit awed by the fact that I was Egyptian. The term Egyptian invoked images of pyramids, pharaohs, and mystique to most people's minds. I was proud of my Egyptian heritage and my dad. I married my husband, Mike, in the summer of 2001, taking on his last name. We were at Fort Hood, Texas that year due to Mike being in the Army. When 9-11 hit, my family's last name took on a whole new view. I remember going out to eat with several members of Mike's company on September 12th. Everyone was on alert and preparing for the inevitable fact that they would be shipped off to Iraq soon. One of the men very loudly stated he was ready to go kill some towel heads. It was within that awkward silence that ensued that I realized my family would be viewed very differently from now on. As reports came in about security targeting certain names in airports, I was relieved that my last name was now of no more concern. Who worries about a girl named Sandy Wade? My dad started to feel uncomfortable within his church as people talked about those people. Who exactly are you talking about, he would ask, never one to be silent as people fumbled over their muttered responses. Even though we weren't Muslim, we were still from over there. Our name, though, was the big problem. It began with those two terrible letters, E-L. People with L or Al get their name targeted a lot. In fact, my cousin officially dropped the L from his name and simply became Bayadi in 2003, purely because he didn't want his children to grow up disadvantaged in society. Bayadi just sounds intriguing. Most people assume we were Italian when they hear it. El Bayadi draws pictures of Arabs and Muslims and terrorists to mind. Ironically, our last name branded our family once again. I find it strange that both Christians and Muslims can discriminate against the same name. For me, our family name simply brings up feelings of comfort and pride for a man who did wonderful things for his family, friends, and community. I embrace it. This is who I am. This is me.
We call your attention to the announcements in the back of the order of service. Immediately following the service today, all are invited to share in a potluck in Freeman Hall. Included will be name games to get to know one another better. Tomorrow evening at 7 p.m., Carol Hartley and Rebecca Jones will lead a poetry ses session that invites us to further explore our names. Visit the adult programming table in Freeman Hall following the service to sign up. This Tuesday, there will be a family picnic at 6 o'clock in Freedom Park. On Thursday at 1245, all are invited to bowling at 10 Park Lanes. Kids bowl free. More information is available for this and additional events in your order of service and on our current webpage, accessed through the UUCC website. In a congregation this size, we have many joys and concerns. We hold in our hearts and prayers Scott Whitesell as he deals with ongoing health concerns and members who are facing long-term health challenges, as well as those who care for them. Everyone is invited to light a candle during the offering to mark a celebration, concern, or remembrance. We invite people into a time of meditation and aspiration. Sit comfortably with your feet flat on the floor and your spine straight. Relax your whole body. Close your eyes if you'd like. Take a deep breath in. Breathe out slowly. May I be treated with kindness and compassion. May my pain and sorrow be eased. May I be at peace. May you be treated with kindness and compassion. May your pain and sorrow be eased. May you be at peace. May we be treated with kindness and compassion. May our pain and sorrow be eased. May we be at peace. May it be so. Seventy-two years ago, our UU forebearers, the founders of this church, boarded a metaphorical boat and entered uncharted territory to establish a new religious home in Charlotte. Today, we are the beneficiaries of their vision, courage, and tenacity, and of those who followed. Let us honor their memory by generously supporting the work of this congregation in this community during these tumultuous times. We will now give and receive the offering.
Please rise in body or spirit to read together an affirmation of our faith. Uh, we are a loving, liberating,
In the immortal words of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Remember, remember always that all of us, you and I especially, are descended from immigrants and revolutionists. Please be seated for the closing music. Okay, so it just occurred to me while I was listening to some of those talks that my, my name is Nakmanoff, and that's an abbreviation. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody down the sound thought Nakmanoff, which was too difficult. So we'll show it to Nakamov. I don't know how much of an improvement that was. But I'm actually very grateful that they did, because all around the country, I could find Nakamovs here and there. I've never seen a Nakamov that wasn't in my immediate family or very closely related. So I think it was just a random immigration official that just chopped it. Um, this song is not about Nakamov. It's about Benedict Spinoza, who started out life with a slightly different name. He was a philosopher born in the Jewish community in Amsterdam in the 17th century. His parents were Portuguese uh, refugees from the Inquisition. And um, as a member of the Jewish community, he uh, it was very close to that community. He uh, made some waves when he took on some very unorthodox views, so to speak. And at the age of 23, he was excommunicated. Now, I'm Jewish, and I didn't even know he had excommunication until I read his <laughs> But he was actually, which was actually a pretty horrible thing because he wasn't allowed to talk to his family, friends, uh, anybody in the community at all. And so his name is given him as Baruch Spinoza, which means blessed in Hebrew. He changed it to Benedict Spinoza, which you know in Latin means the same thing. Uh, there are a lot of songs about him though. So I thought, if not me, who would do, who would do such a thing, right? So write a Spinoza song. So this is his song, it's called Spinoza Street. I'm glad. 